Okay, well, I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, particularly in the nature of time, we are going to keep this tight um, and interactive and engaging. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Bobby. I'm the president of Campus Compact, and I'm thrilled to be joined with my colleague here, Luke Terrell, who's representing Irislice, who's going to give some remarks in just a moment. This is our first of a multi-part series focused on sharing the stories of the exemplars from our field, specifically focused on those individuals and, institute, and individuals that are representing institutions who were selected this past year as winners of either the Campus Compact Impact Awards or the 2022 Iyer Slice Awards. And if you're wondering how we brought these together, it really was out of a sense of partnership and collaboration between Campus Compact and Iyer Slice and really thinking about how we can both elevate and support members of our field and both not just celebrating those award winners, but also getting to unpack journeys and having some chance and having some time to connect with one another, understand what were the paths that came to this work, what motivates people, and what are some of those challenges that folks are wrestling with. Um, I'll turn it now to Luke, who will provide some remarks and also give us a sense of how the event is going to flow today. Thanks, Bobby, and thanks everyone for joining. My name is Luke Terra. I serve on the board of the International Association for Research on Service Learning and Community Engagement. That's the last time I do that to you, I promise. We call it Iyer Slice. Um, if you are not familiar with the association and the work that we do, I'd encourage you to check it out. Uh, we'd love to have you involved. Uh, we were excited to partner with Campus Compact in this joint uh, awards and recognition series, of which this is the first one. Um, because we know that there is so much overlap in the, both the, um, the members of our associations and the mission and purposes that we seek to serve in the field. And so we're so delighted to be able to lift up and recognize some outstanding practitioners from both of our associations and to bring them into conversation with each other and with our memberships. So thank you so much for joining. Um, IR Slice recognizes uh, individuals and teams whose research contributes significantly to understanding and advancing community engagement across all approaches, service learning, political engagement, internships, CBR, um, uh, community engaged research, and across all sectors, primary, secondary, and higher ed, as well as informal educational settings. We have a number of uh, awards and recognitions that we will be um, lifting up and recognizing over the upcoming four events. And we'll get to introductions for each of our award winners who are joining us today in a moment. Uh, as far as the run of show, here's kind of how we plan to use our time together. As Bobby mentioned, we wanted to um, provide opportunities for our award recipients to share a little bit about their journeys into this work and what motivates them in the work that they do. Uh, and so that's where we'll start. We'll introduce each of our award recipients and give them an opportunity to share briefly with all of us about their journeys and motivations. From there, we're going to break out probably into breakout rooms uh, with each of the award recipients so that we can have some smaller conversations with some of the attendees and each of the award recipients. We'll bring everyone back for some for a whole group conversation and some highlights from that. Um, and then we'll close and share a little bit about some of the upcoming events. So that's our um, hour that we have ahead of us. I'll pass back to Bobby. Awesome. So as Luke said, um, the way we're organizing today is we're going to have all four of our special guests today, giving you a sense of their journey, kind of framing for you um, what has gotten to the, them to this point, what motivates them. And we're going to do it through hopefully an engaging way of really focusing on some imagery um, to steer that conversation. Something I wanted to know about, particularly the Campus Compact Impact Awards, and I'll ask Molly, who's with me today, to throw a link in chat so you can see the full release um, of all of our award winners, but we actually recognize at Campus Compact, I think similar to Iris Slice, we look at both institutions as well as individuals. Um, and we have two institutional awards. The two institutional awards, one is for a four-year um, institution, and that is called the Richard Garci Award for Institutional Transformation. And then the second award is the Eduardo Padron Award for Institutional Transformation. And the first two folks, first two individuals and leaders that I'm excited to introduce, who are going to talk to you um, in just a second to kick us off, are from our this year's award winner, and that is Piedmont Virginia Community College. Piedmont is a public community college located in Charlottesville, Virginia. It has a deep commitment to preparing students for lives of engaged citizenship and is evidenced by curricular and co-curricular activities. And for the past three years, PVCC has offered civic engagement classes in each major and made them a requirement 
for graduation, something that all of us across the field would love to see picked up and utilized across our colleges, across the country. They maintain a very deep emphasis on civic learning and action. And that's through engaging students in voter engagement efforts, deliberative dialogues, a number of different campus-wide experiences. And I'm thrilled today to have two incredible representatives of Piedmont Virginia Community College. First, we have President Jean Runyon joining us. Jean, has been, Jean, Jean is the newer president of Piedmont Virginia Community College, and she's the sixth president. Prior to accepting the presidency at Piedmont Virginia, she was the campus vice president at Front Range Community College um, in Colorado from 2015 to 2022. Following Jean, we're going to welcome Connie Jorgensen. Connie is the uh, uh, sorry is the assistant professor of political science, but she also oversees the quality enhancement plan. For those in our field, you have seen Connie through the years representing the organization and also the great work she leads civic engagement activities across the college. So I will turn it over to Jean and then Connie. Good afternoon, everyone, and what a privilege to join you all today. So as Bobby mentioned, I had the honor of joining Piedmont Virginia Community College just last July, so I'm not quite a year old in my position. And so for me, it was really important to come alongside and be able to celebrate and champion the good work that has already been in place. And when I think about civic engagement, it really goes back to there has to be a visionary, there has to be somebody who can come alongside and co-create the vision and then bring it to fruition and Connie definitely is that champion and visionary. And she's really united the campus uh, and the college around the importance of civic engagement. And she'll share some of the important pieces with that. But it also starts with leadership that it's really a college-wide experience, um, something that's really important to the college and for our students and to our graduates as well. And so we formalize this in many different ways. Connie's position is one, um, but the other way is we are uh, accredited by SAC COC. And as part of that accreditation and reaff reaffirmation of accreditation, um, the college has an opportunity to select a quality enhancement plan, which really centers around an issue of importance for the college and civic engagement was that important issue that came to light in the development of the quality enhancement plan. And it's called Civic Sense, and Connie will share a little bit more about that. But what Civic Sense was intended to do is to really empower our students um, to be leaders and to have a strong commitment to democracy and diversity and in, to engage in in practice in the communities that they serve. And there were actually three key student learning outcomes. One, we wanted our graduates to be able to actively participate in civic life, in civic life by voting in elections. Uh, we wanted our graduates to participate in civic life by engaging in public service or other activities that improve the conditions of their community. And we wanted our graduates to be able to think critically about issues of public consequence. And I just wanna say joining the college, getting to learn um, more about our civic engagement work, really coming alongside Connie to champion the work that is already in place. It's just a privilege to be in this role um, and at this college. And so I'll turn it over to Connie who'll share more. Okay. Well, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, and I'm really proud of the work that we're doing at Piedmont. I think we have, um, we've really latched on to something that works in our college. I'll tell you how I got into this business is that I used to be a legislative aide for a member of the House of Delegates here in Virginia. And what I learned there was one person can make a difference. And I tried to put, bring that into my political science classes and then, and we continue, we started doing, you know, all the regular voting registration stuff that most colleges do now. But then um, we wanted to do more. And unfortunately, uh, you may know Charlottesville because of the Unite the Right rally in uh, 2017 that occurred here. And that's what really taught us that we have to do something about civic engagement. We have to teach our students to think critically, to be engaged in their communities. And that was kind of the genesis of our QEP. There's two basic pieces of it. There's the co-curricular and the curricular. Um, and the co-curricular, the biggest thing there is our, our voter registration and our get out the vote efforts. Uh, we try to engage students as much as possible in doing the registration. Um, 
And they've done a really great job of that. We have a very high uh, voter turnout rate um, based on our NSOL reports. Uh, I think it was 71 plus percent in uh, 2020. 2020, yes, in 2020. So we're, we're really proud of this, but you know, if it's 70%, we can still get 30% more. So we've got a lot of work to do. We recently did a survey of our students uh, in conjunction with Campus Compact to learn a little bit about why our students vote. And a really interesting thing came out of this is that the most common reason people cited at our college for voting was civic duty. Um, and I found that fascinating because that really wasn't what I was expecting. But there's a strong connection between voting and civic duty. And I want to explore that with our students just a little bit more. Um, also, we found out that our students are a little bit, not a little bit, a lot concerned about their votes being counted. Uh, there's a distrust of the system, and that's something else I really want to work on. So it's an ever-evolving piece. The curricular piece is, I think, the, the uh, you can move the slide ahead if you want. Um, the curricular piece, I think, is the most important thing that we do. We, uh, the students are required to take a civic engagement class in their major. And that doesn't mean they take like a class that's labeled civic engagement, because we couldn't add any additional credits to the graduation requirements. So what we had to do was bring the civic engagement into the coursework. So a civic engagement class has students assessing a public problem within their discipline. For example, physics or accounting or English or political science, it's got to be a public problem that relates to their major. Um, they've got to consider how to address it. They've got to put the public problem in context of their course and then do some reflection on that. Um, a couple of my favorite examples of this, uh, and I use this one all the time. So if we, if I've met you before, you've heard this. Our physics professor, I found, was absolutely brilliant. I'll tell you when she, when we first um, discussed this, she was adamantly opposed to this, um, and many faculty were because remember we're a community college and we teach general ed courses, and gen ed courses have a lot of content that you have to get through, right? Uh, and you have to get through it all. And adding a civic engagement piece just seemed like too much. So what we're trying to get them to do is take what they're teaching already and just teach it a little bit differently. So the physics professor, uh, Yana, this was at the beginning of COVID and she couldn't figure out how she was possibly gonna put civic engagement in her course. And her course was selected because it's a required course for engineering that everybody had to take. So it was the perfect CE course in that major. And one day she, you know, she was, could not figure out how to do it. And one day she called me and she said, I was sitting at a stoplight, you know, the stoplight story, right? She said, I was sitting at a stoplight and I figured out how to do this. She said, and this is all I know about physics, so bear with me. There's physics concepts like uh, fluid, uh, fluid um, uh, force, projection, all of that fluid dynamics, all that kind of stuff. So she said what she was gonna do was use all those physics concepts and talk about the physics of a sneeze, okay? Remember, this is the beginning of the pandemic and mask wearing was quite controversial. And she used that physics piece to teach her students about the, the value of wearing a mask and gave them the data so they could make their own decision. And it was all about physics. And I, I just I just love that creativity. Uh, we have a biology professor who, when she goes through her course every every week, you know, the different topics, she somehow brings in antibiotic resistant bacteria and you know uses that at the end to talk about policy. Um, prescribing antibiotics. And I could go on and on and on. 
This picture we've got here is another biology professor who brings in the Ravana Conservation Alliance, which is a local, local nonprofit, and they study the streams around Piedmont. And so they're working with a, a local nonprofit, a local conservation nonprofit, and learning from them, but also learning um, how to identify issues in their streams. You can move to the next slide. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to kind of stop it there. But I think that one thing about our civic engagement courses is the civic engagement portion has to be a full 25% of the grade. And that's a lot. And it's, I'm really impressed by the way this actually worked out, that our faculty were able to integrate this. And, and what they found also is that they were already teaching civic engagement, they just didn't realize it. And so it just caused them to kind of re, reapproach their, um, their discipline. And many of our faculty, um, specifically, uh, several specifically, have said it totally changed the way they look at teaching. And that, you know, even if we never do this again after the QEP, they're going to continue to do the CE portion in their classes because it was so valuable, not only to them, but to their students. And um, I can ask, answer question, more questions later on, but um, that's all. Thank you, Connie, and thank you, Jean, and congratulations again to Piedmont Virginia Community College. Next up, we are going to focus on some individual award winners. And the first one we're going to hear from is the recipient this year of the Nadine Cruz Community Engagement Professional Award. This award celebrates the ethical leadership and advocacy demonstrated by CEPs. Recipients have demonstrated collaboration with communities, focused on transformative change, and have a deep commitment to justice-oriented work. And they also have an impact on the larger movement on building ethical and effective community engagement. I don't think there's anyone that more embodies that description than this year's award winner, Star Plaxton Moore. Star is the University of San Francisco's Director of Community Engaged Learning at the Leo T. McCarthy Center for Public Service and the Common Good. She is being recognized for her transformational work supporting and advocating for critical and justice-oriented community-engaged learning. Her work focuses on building accountability and respect among faculty, community partner, co-educators, and students. She's authored two books, The Student Companion on Community-Engaged Learning and The Craft of Community-Engaged Teaching and Learning. Star has worked across the country with professionals, and because of her great work, we have more engaged learning courses that are centered in social justice, and sustain equitable and mutually beneficial relationships. Welcome, Star. Thanks, Bobby. Um, it's great to be with everyone today. And it was a fun assignment to choose some photos to represent my journey. Uh, so this is a little bit different from what our colleagues at PVCC shared, because it's more of, I think, reflections on my personal journey. Um, so I guess I'll start with the, the photo of uh, my grandmother in the top middle. Um, her name was Patricia Chamberlain, and she was a kindergarten teacher for over 30 years in East San Jose. And when I was a little girl, I used to love coming to visit her for so many reasons. I mean, she was, you know, the things that made her a great kindergarten teacher made her a really fun grandmother as well. Uh, and sometimes she would take me to her classroom, which was filled with music. She played the piano, the children sang. It was always nice to see that. But what was really special was when I would uh, go with her on different errands around the neighborhood. And no matter where we went, if it was the, you know, if we went to the pharmacy, if we went to the movies, if we went to McDonald's, wherever we went, uh, it seemed like almost everywhere, someone would stop her and say, are you Miss Chamberlain? And she would say, yes. And they'd say, I was in your kindergarten class, you know, X number of years ago. It was people of all ages. Um, and it was such a fun class. And I loved kindergarten so much. And I remember as a child, just first of all, thinking my grandmother was a celebrity, which is kind of funny. But 
but also really starting to recognize um, the impact that educators have um, on so many people. And I think that was really kind of the spark that led me to know that I wanted to work, um, you know, work in education. And, um, you know, there were times when I strayed away from that as a teenager and in college, I thought I wanted to pursue different passions. Um, but ultimately, I came back to knowing that that I wanted to teach. And I think a big part of that was just being a witness to how the impact that my grandmother had. Um, the next photo below it is me. This was actually me just last week working with our incoming equity interns who are students working with the YMCA Power Scholars Academy to um, support youth in uh, their academic programming that's running this summer. And it was such a joy to spend time with students. And I think, you know, what motivated me early in my career and what I keep coming back to is just uh, the joy of getting to work with young people who have big ideas and open minds and so many aspirations and possibilities that are open to them. And, you know, early on, I really appreciated building those relationships directly with students as, as a mentor, as an educator, as an advisor. Um, and I still enjoy that. I get to do that less. But what I enjoy, I think, even more so now is fostering the conditions that allow students to build community with each other. Um, and really allow them to build those connections, learn from each other, um, have their own understandings and biases challenged, um, and get to really be vulnerable and grow together. And so, you know, I think sometimes when we do this work at our colleges and universities, there's, there's a lot of ways that it, it's really challenging. And I, I find that sometimes I feel very much at odds with uh, my institution. I know they write my checks and, and they give me a good living, but at the same time, some of the decisions around um, our business practices and, and other things don't always feel like they're very community oriented or very social justice oriented. Um, and so when I'm kind of navigating uh, those feelings of ambivalence around working at a higher education institution, uh, one way I kind of return to my motivation is to really remind myself about the students and the students are really why, uh, why I do the work. And then uh, the picture on the right, I think hopefully it's your right and my right, that's me in my um, doctoral gown uh, from graduation a couple of years ago. And those are my two kids looking up at me. And so, um, you know, I was a first generation college student when I went to undergrad and I didn't know how to navigate college. It was a struggle for me. And one of the things that I appreciate about getting to work in a college and university setting is that I'm demystifying a lot of this experience for my kids and sort of breaking the cycle of struggle uh, that I went through when, when I was going to college. And, and so I find that to be really meaningful and also I have one child who is incredibly concerned about the climate crisis, and I have one child who's transgender. And so um, addressing issues of injustice is very much, um, it's very personal for me. It's deeply affecting my children and my family, and I know that's the case with others. And so um, another thing that motivates me is just really feeling the urgency of being involved in positive change so that um, all of our children are, you know, growing into a world that's more sustainable and more inclusive and more loving. Um, let's see, on the left, this is a photo that was taken at the Kumu conference in San Diego, and it was such a joyful, it's always a joyful experience for me to get together with colleagues at conferences and other gatherings. Um, you know, a lot of these people in this picture in particular, but in general, the folks who come to these conferences are people that early in my career, I admired from afar, right? The folks who were writing the important articles, the folks who had amazing programs that I wanted to emulate. And it's been such a gift to, um, you know, be able to be in relationship uh, with these folks in various ways, whether it's um, them taking me on um, and sort of mentoring me along the way and 
developing friendships um, and really seeing that really being able to kind of count on them as critical friends, folks who really push my thinking and my practice. And I find more and more that this is, is an extremely motivating factor for me. Um, it's just the, the professional relationships and friendships that I've gotten to build um, and that have sustained me. And then last, I'll just point out uh, the book cover on the left, All About Love, which is basically my Bible. I feel like it's that book in particular has revolutionized um, the way I live in <laughs> all aspects of my life, parenting, my how I show up in relationship with my spouse, how I do my work, how I show up in my friendships. Um, but it's also emblematic of this body of literature that's been extremely influential in the past few years for me, which is um, critical feminist scholarship and really using that to shape how I understand community engagement and give me uh, new ways of thinking about and doing that work. So I guess I will close it there. Thank you, Star. Really appreciate those reflections. Um, our last um, award recipient that we're excited to recognize on behalf of the Board of Iris Slice, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Keith Wattenpaw, Professor of Human Rights Studies and Founding Director of the Human Rights Studies Program at the University of California at Davis. And to recognize Dr. Wattenpaw as the winner of the 2022 Iris Slice Public Scholarship Award for his contributions to the well being of refugee students through the Article 26 backpack which supports refugee and other vulnerable students to gain access to higher education around the world. The Public Scholarship Award recognizes exemplary interdisciplinary research that has a, dem a demonstrable and ameliorative impact on pressing public issues with a special focus on the knowledge needs of policymakers and practitioners. The award recognizes research that generates non-traditional scholarly products presented in a manner that is widely accessible to target audiences and or the general public. Dr. Wattenpah's work directly addresses a critical gap for refugee students seeking access to higher education and the approach that his team has taken in developing and implementing the program centers the needs and dignity of young people the program serves. The program has already served thousands of young people and is available in seven languages. In the words of one nominator, through his scholarly service and teaching record, Keith demonstrates all of the qualities that you seek in a public scholar. Reciprocity in community-based work, exceptional rigor of scholarship, a significant focus on accessibility, and research that is both highly generative and of significant public impact. We are honored and delighted to recognize Dr. Wattenpah with this award. And let me hand off to Keith. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, first, I want to thank the board of Iris Slice for this recognition. At UC Davis, we are undergoing, I think, a great a great effort to bring public scholarship and civic engagement into, into the university. And these awards are very important um, at this great and important time of transition. I'm hoping that my institution can be one of the um, public division one research universities to really lead this effort. And under the leadership of Chancellor of uh, Associate Vice Chancellor Michael Rios, I think we're making incredible pro progress. So I I'm also, I, I should have put my grandmother's picture up there too, because I had two grandmothers who taught in school for 30 years who really helped shape some of my, um, some of my approaches and always how proud I am to say that I'm a teacher, even though many of my colleagues would, would, would never want to say that about themselves. So, but let me just begin um, with these images. Uh, the image on the upper left is a picture from the Zatari refugee camp in 2013, almost exactly a little over a decade ago. As many of you know, the Syrian civil war began in 2012 in the midst of the Arab Spring, uh, and it went bad real quick, real fast, and became one of the worst civil wars of our young century, uh, killing well over um, half a million people and putting five million people on the road as refugees and another five million as internally displaced people. I done most of my graduate work and research, and even I spent an undergraduate year at the American University in Cairo in the Middle East. I've lived in Syria and Lebanon and Jordan. And in 2003, I was one of the first American academics to enter Iraq after the United States invasion and occupation of that country, and really left that moment committed to um, the need for those of us who can 
to help use institutions of higher learning in particular to promote peace uh, and to prevent war. And that motivated me to work with colleagues to start the UC Davis Human Rights Studies Program, which is the largest human rights studies program by enrollment and minors in the, in the entire United States. Um, and we have a burgeoning uh, graduate program as well. One of our things looking forward we're trying to do is to build in more community engaged learning and opportunities for our students, like the ones that we've seen um, from the other institutions that have been awarded and individuals that have been awarded in this ceremony. So in the upper left is Zatari refugee camp in 2013. And when I lived in Syria, I had many, many friends who had been university students. I first was there as a graduate student and I had been invited to give a paper in Jordan. I went over spring break and I said to myself and others, I wonder what's being done to help university students from that war. And we went to the UNHCR and to a very important official from UNESCO. And we said, what are you doing to help university students? And they replied, oh, there are no university students amongst these refugees. There was a, a, an incredible knowledge gap um, in terms of, of how they understood the, the diversity of the refugee population. And that picture is a picture of half a dozen refugee women graduates and undergraduates from several Syrian universities in that camp. So there certainly were many. And we were there to try to find out how we could help them reconnect with higher education. And it was just like a seminar. I mean, I took sort of the tools that I was very comfortable with, talking to young people, listening, and all of this was happening in Arabic. Uh, and we began to form a picture of some of the challenges that were facing them in their efforts. And there's a series of reports that we wrote and so on. But one area we identified very early on was that people would often lose their documents. And I know that sounds like a very prosaic problem to Americans who think, oh, I can just go and download it again. That's not really a problem. But if you're a refugee or you're coming out of an authoritarian society um, where the government uses access to documents as a kind of social discipline, or you're you know, on the road and you're trying to you, 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 things get stolen, they get burned, they get washed away. Loss of documents can lead to um, not being allowed to enroll in your next step. So we came up with the idea of the Article 26 backpack named for the 26th article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which assures us that everyone has a right to education and said we can apply some modern technology to making it possible for people to safely store, secure, curate, and share their materials. But I also brought these pictures because they're demonstrating some of the key components of public scholarship and civic engagement. So in this picture, I'm talking and listening. In this one, I'm bringing the idea to communities of need and asking them, is this something you could really use? So this picture on the right, uh, upper right, is a picture from a refugee camp school uh, in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon in 2016, where after having sort of rounded up some money, we came with the idea, and I talked with a group of, of Syrian university students who were working as teachers, and they thought it was a good idea, and they were willing to help and support it. And so the pack pack was developed, um, and I can go into the technical details and so on later, but what, it all, what also happened was, as the backpack grew, it became this incredible opportunity for service learning from amongst our undergraduate human rights studies population. And so during the pandemic, this was really hard because usually we would just go to these areas. And so we received a grant from MasterCard Foundation to bring backpack to, you, to Rwanda and we couldn't go. And so our undergraduates seen here began to develop online um, relationships with their counterparts overseas. Um, and I think it's a generational issue because I find that very difficult, but they were able to do it very well. And then eventually they helped build a relationship with similar, um, with, with, with undergraduates and so on in Rwanda, who then were able to reach out and assist other refugees in need by connecting them with the backpack and the backpack idea. But backpack is, is more than just an app. It's more than just a way to store documents. It's a way to build connection because amongst refugees, especially amongst young educated refugees, there's this sense that the world has forgotten them, has left them behind. And indeed, that is mostly true. And Backpack is our way to stand in solidarity and support 
and to recognize and affirm and witness their human right to education. Now, my final note, I also want, I think these pictures demonstrate something very important. I'm front and center in the first one. I'm fading into the distance in the second one. I'm absent altogether in the third. And the fourth one, I'm several thousand miles away. In other words, I think one of our most important roles as educators in this field is to begin to step back and not be at the center, but let those that we're hoping will take over for us, that will be the future leaders, become empowered enough and well-trained enough that they can take on more and more responsibility. And at this point, Backpack is a largely student-to-student, peer-to-peer run institution with nearly 4,000 people in it using seven different languages. Uh, and it seems to be working well. We always need more money. But it seems to be seems to be working well. But it's also, again, telling young people around the world, from Afghanistan to Iran to East Africa to the Middle East to Burma to South America, that even if they're displaced, they have not been forgotten. So again, thank you for this award. It's it's very meaningful to me. Thank you, Keith. Um, and thank you to all of our award recipients for sharing those great reflections. Uh, for our next uh, 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 part of our program, we're going to break out into small breakout rooms so that you can chat a little bit more with some of the award recipients individually. Uh, let me hand off to Bobby, who's been doing some behind the scenes Zoom magic. Okay, I'm going to send everybody off into the rooms um, and we're going to have, I think, just about 10 minutes, um, 10, 12 minutes to um, talk, ask questions from what you heard, ask other questions if you're just curious about um, some of their, some of the history and the pathways um, and uh, we'll, we'll keep it pretty organic from there. You just have to do a little bit of moving there and I think we are good. Here they go.